Hello again, this is Kat Sneevens with Ashes of Creation, last week's news today. We have a ton of news to go through, so we'll jump right in. Most of it came from the live stream on Friday, so our setup will be a little different this week. Following congratulations to Intrepid for ending their internal milestone, too. Starting off with the YouTube highlighted comment, I don't know if it's going to be a thing, but I think the palms should sway in the desert wind, the same with the dunes and sand blowing. Maybe that would be too intensive, but it would look so cool. Steven clarified that we'll see winds that are of different strengths and at different times. The team are aware of the impact it can have on performance, but performance is at the forefront of their mind, and they are utilizing tools to help with that performance. It looks pretty smooth so far. Also, if you haven't seen the season's reveal, you should go check that out. It will give you an idea of what we can expect with the weather. Now, Alpha 2 is also going to have forest, riverlands, alongside the desert biomes, as well as other types such as badlands. Some of these landscapes are looking really good. I love how dense the forests are looking, as what we saw in Alpha 1 was very generic in comparison. Great progress there, in my opinion. We then got a look at the Minotaurs for the first time. We'll be seeing these in combat in next month's live stream against the Ranger. It was said that these guys have their own class system similar to the players as each have unique abilities depending on what their job is. Also a horrifying fact is that the Dunir are born with their beards attached to the skull beneath the skin. Like some kind of hair teeth. Yikes. Anyway, I absolutely love the one with the shield. It's terrifying, yet also it looks like the armor on there is like a drawing a kid gives to a parent to put on the fridge so that they know their parents are proud of them. We also got to see another world boss in the form of a gigantic cyclops that we will see roaming the Riverlands, and this cool Naga slash Yanti like mob, which we'll most likely see in a dungeon. Next, we got the female Empyrean concept art paired with the in game model. She's gorgeous, and I really like how closely they are able to keep the in game models to the concept art. And for all those that were asking, the crowns are just an accessory and are not attached to the elves. Not sure who thought that, but here you go. And the Nakua concept art is just amazing, so happy with how they're turning out. I wonder if they have their hair teeth just like the Dunir. <clears throat> then we got to see the new direction for the Veiloon. We got a tiny bit of lore for them as well. When they step through the portals, they appear to have essence-like ruptures in their skin. They have the Jin-like influence in their lineage, which makes them quite different to the Kalar, whom will have a range of options for skin color. Taking the Veiloon in a slightly different direction should mean you don't just have two identical options in character creation. Thank goodness. Then we got the next big reveal, the updated world map. Not only has its layout changed, the map has gotten much bigger. This is the new world map in all its 1200 square kilometer glory. So there's a lot of names here, a little reveal of some of the locations in these areas. And of course, seeing similar biomes that are present as well. But more importantly, what you're seeing is the orientation of these continents and these islands are facilitating specific types of intercontinental trade gameplay, and they support the relevance of these caravans moving across the landmass to locations that will now incorporate these harbor areas, which aren't identified on the map. But the important part was providing a lot of coastal naval gameplay between these zones and the trade routes between land bases. So at launch, the land size is roughly 480 square kilometers, and the water slash ocean size is about 750 square kilometers, not including the Underrealm, which it was 100 square kilometers. So we don't know if it's changed or not. If you are running from node center to node center, it would take you about five minutes, but remember, not all these nodes will be developed, so it won't be towns at every center. If you were to travel from the top of one continent down to the other side, it would take roughly 50 minutes if mounted or 75 minutes on foot. We also got an update on nodes and how vassal nodes work. We have moved from 103 nodes to 85 nodes, and there's a few reasons for that. One, when we were doing the calculations behind how in Alpha 2 and in the game we want these vassal structures to exist, we had more nodes than what felt meaningful, and we wanted to condense some of that so that those curated story arcs and hooks into the environment and realm around the areas to be more bountiful at a lesser node value, meaning bring down the node count so that we can increase the richness of each of those nodes more than what was at 103. So there is a lot of information in this quote, so read the full thing on the wiki, but a sovereign at level 6 can have two level 5 vassal nodes, and a level 5 can have a level 4 and a level 3 node underneath. And then the level 4 can have a level 3, and so on. Now if the level 3 gets removed through Siege, the 1 or 2 below it is removed as well. There is an important distinction between the level 3's vassals, which technically isn't really a vassal relationship, because there's no citizenships possible. Those vassals don't exist between 3 and 0, but they do exist between 4 and 3, 5 and 4, and 6 and 5. What this also allows is that because there are 85 nodes that are within the world, we have a buffer zone of about 20 nodes that lives 
in a max server state. So if you had a max five metropolises in a world, you will have a number of about 20 nodes that can live alongside those metropolis networks. And when or if a metropolis falls, that extra cushion of nodes around the five metropolis structures allows for the map to be redistricted in a way that is unique. It doesn't mean that one of the fives is just going to pick up where the last six left off and form the same exact metropolis structure. From a territory perspective, it has ancillary nodes to play with and expand towards. That redistricts the map so that if a metropolis falls, there's a significant difference in the layout of the world and of these almost nation-like territories. So definitely check out the wiki, which deserves a tremendous shout out for always doing an amazing job. Or you can ask in the comments as well. Also, the concurrent players is still staying at 8 to 10,000 per server. The map changes don't affect their current plan for freehold and node housing. Phew. Then they revealed the policy system for nodes. Node policies are unlocked by various activities within a node that either increase or decrease the happiness state of the node. High levels of happiness will unlock more policies. Low levels of happiness might even disable certain NPCs or services within the node. Nodes have a number of slots that they get to employ as government policies that are enacted and chose by the mayor and voted by the people, and certain policies get unlocked by certain happiness states of the factions within the node and those happiness states are predicated across different achievements that can happen in the world, story arcs that get finished, bosses that get killed around you, new buildings that get constructed. Lots of different things can contribute to that happiness value. Number of citizens, number of citizens you've had leave, number of houses that might have been foreclosed upon. There's lots of different things that influence it. But when happiness is met at a certain point, and even without that happiness, you can still have policies that you can enact regardless. You may choose policies that do certain things for the node and this is a big strategic decision that the node has to almost agree on because it's voted on by the citizens within a short time period and elected by the outstanding mayor and when you deploy a policy it confers benefits to the citizens or to the area or to specific buildings or to the mayor. Also, another big change I'm sure some people are excited about is that being out on the open sea is now an automatic flag location. So when you move off of land, we have a flagging system that protects and the open seas are international waters where you need to be careful. And there's a lot of opportunity that's unique to that content like treasure finding. There's a lot of different stuff out there, so there needs to be risk associated with opportunity. There are still alternate methods of traveling between the two continents, including flight paths between coastal nodes, airships between metropolises, uh, uh, and also a scientific nodes, vassal networks, teleportation options, should that network extend across the seas or to nodes on islands. Although none of these methods will allow the transit of materials or gatherables, there will also be a healthy amount of sea content within the coastlines of the continents that does not fall into the open sea area. So there will be danger beyond just other players lurking out in the deep sea. And speaking of deep, we still have more news to share. We know this is a long one. Thanks for making it this far. So don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe so that we can continue bringing the news to you every week. Also, please make sure to comment here on YouTube, Reddit, the forums, or wherever you want to give your opinion so Intrepid can get feedback on everything that's been revealed. We were recently introduced to the Caravansary system, and in this live stream, we got a little more depth of what that entails. First, you construct your caravan at the caravansary, and you can only launch a caravan that has been constructed and is at that caravansary. Then it will build it using the components that are there. If you're missing components, the system will build it with the automatic lower quality bits and bobs. Once it is built, the caravan will be hosted at that caravansary. When you go to launch your caravan, you select which caravan you have available at the caravansary. UI will pop up to show you what compartments you have available and you can assign those compartments to members of a party or named interest and you can apply insurance if you want to. Then once it is prepped, it will go into a launch ready state and then you can launch it whenever you want. When you click the launch button, your perspective will go to a world map perspective and then you'll be able to pick a location within a 360 degree line of about 100 to 150 meters around the node and spawn the caravan there. It may take two to five minutes to spawn. You and your party will be able to teleport to that launch location only. On delivering to a node, you will see a visual disembark line at a distance similar to the spawn distance. Upon entering the disembark line, your caravan is safe and auto moves into the receiving caravansary with NPC guards, etc. 
taking good care of your trusty caravan. From here, Stephen reminds us that the receiving node doesn't have to be your final destination. You could also redeploy and carry on. He also mentioned that naval merchant systems work the same like land caravans, but rather than the caravansary, you go to the harbors. The big difference is that merchant ships can't turn into land caravans. We're moving on to the Fan Art Friday. Ultra Mel from New Zealand did a really cool take on the Pyrae female. And as always, great job. If you made it to the end, thank you so much. We know this week was a chunky video. If your Q&A question wasn't answered in the live stream, Thaknar has responded to them on a comment on the thread. We got the link below. Steven also mentioned there will be an Ask Me Anything on Reddit with some forum questions in October. So another great reason to hit that sub button so we can keep you up to date every Sunday with all the announcements. That's all for this week, so I hope you all enjoyed the long video today and I hope to see you all again really soon. This is Kat Sneven signing out.